Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, one true God. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Greetings and blessings to all of you, and welcome to yet another episode of Theologia. I have entitled today's theological discourse of mine as Patristic Symphony. Dearly beloved in Christ, one of our primary creedal confessions about the Church is that the Church is apostolic. The apostolicity of the Church rests strongly and vividly on the apostolic kerygma, that is the apostolic proclamation. We are called to proclaim not our own idiosyncratic faith, but the faith of the apostles taught by our Lord Jesus Christ. The probable digression of faith that we see today was forewarned by St. Paul who stated, For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. Thus, apostolic charisma becomes the decisive hallmark that determines the apostolicity of the church. One of the major pathways to discern the apostolic charisma is to engage with the patristic heritage. It is quite disconcerting that the contemporary academia relegates patristic to a historical epoch between classical antiquity and early middle ages instead of the theologically informed reference to the church fathers and mothers. Augustine Cassidy elucidates, I quote, When we use the terms patristics and fathers, we are not referring to a remote period in the past, nor do we apply it indiscriminately to people who lived in the past. Instead, those terms are used selectively. We are collectively looking back and acknowledging our debts to say to certain people who have gone on before. When we refer to some people as fathers, what happens is that we identify them as standing in a parental relationship to us. We are, if you like, adopting them as our parents. This family relationship, like all relationships, is dynamic. Unquote. Theology has its own language and it cannot be extrapolated to the signs of time without comprehending its emergence and contours. As Rowan William notes, I quote, Theology is perennially tempted to be seduced by the prospect of bypassing the question of how it learns its own language. Unquote. Thus, we engage with the patristic heritage to learn this language so that we could internalize its essence and vision so as to transform as well as transcend it. We join the symphony of our holy fathers and mothers so that the apostolic harmony and melody is not disturbed. Father John Bear beautifully remarks, I quote, Reading the fathers symphonically in this way attunes us to the melody that is theology. There is indeed no reason simply to repeat what certain fathers have said, but if one is going to rehearse, if one is not going to rehearse with care and accuracy particular movements of this symphony, then one must provide an account of what it is one is in fact doing." Unquote. The 20th century witnessed a time of renewal for orthodox scholasticism and pietism prompted by orthodox diaspora and ecumenical dialogues. The two most prominent maxims proposed were returned to the fathers by the neo patristic synthesis by Father George Florovsky and beyond the fathers by the Russian school of theology. These two propositions become problematic if they are considered mutually exclusive and exhaustive in themselves. For instance, return to the fathers 
should not be understood as an invitation to return and stay in the saccharine nostalgia of the past. That would be morbid and deplorable. Rather, it should be a critical and creative return to acquire the mind of the fathers at Menton Petra, so as to grapple with the challenges of the future informed by the present. Furthermore, beyond the fathers should not be understood as a wayward severing from our fathers, but a journey forward with them rather than without them. So the two propositions should be interpreted as mutually interdependent. We return to gain a momentum to move ahead and not to move away. This is what makes the tradition living in the purest sense. As Gustav Mahler beautifully puts it, I quote, Tradition is not to preserve the ashes, but to pass on the flame. Unquote. It is good to meditate on Walter Benjamin's painting entitled Angel of Progress, where history is depicted as an angel being blown backward into the future. So is our journey in time. We are moving backward into future, and it is our past that helps us navigate. A better analogy would be of an oarsman rowing a boat. To use the words of T.S. Eliot, a perception not only of the pastness of the past, but also of its presence. While we engage with the patristic heritage, we need to take cognizance of the fact that the Holy Fathers and Mothers do not possess answers to all questions posed by modernity. In fact, when we foist the questions of our times on them, we actually make the patristic tradition docile and malleable and also put forward an erroneous message that they mark the boundaries of theological credibility and legitimacy. In other words, implying that what cannot be traced back to the Holy Fathers and Mothers is theologically illegitimate. This sort of uncritical and constant invocation of Holy Fathers and Mothers is what Aristotle Papanicola calls patristic fundamentalism and Alan Brown calls patristism. We need to bear in mind that the Holy Fathers and Mothers are not ipso facto infallible and saintliness is not akin to inerrancy. The purpose of reading the Holy Fathers and Mothers is not to garner quotations to justify our prejudices, but to understand how they exegete the scriptures and thereby appropriate theology. Dear friends, may I conclude? Patristic heritage is not an inert deposit of the treasury of faith handed down to us to like or loathe. It is indeed living but it is our mode of reception which makes us experience its aliveness. If we are passive in receiving this heritage, then we experience only a static body of propositions. The fidelity to this heritage is exhibited not in its uncontaminated preservation from the world, but in its transformative transmission. It is in the continuation from where they left. To acquire the mind of the Holy Fathers and Mothers does not mean the mechanical reiteration of their sayings, but to inculcate their legacy of confrontation and dissent, to critically assess the society rather than supinely succumb to its endorsements. It is owning the prudence of redeeming and reorienting the resources of our age by putting it to the service of God, just as the Israelites used the gold of Egyptians to build a tabernacle for God and our holy fathers and mothers used the pagan Hellenistic philosophy and philology for the exposition of Christian faith. This is the patristic legacy, a legacy of confrontation, redemption and transcendence. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, one true God. Amen.